the nice introduction. So yeah, when maintaining CI CD pipelines, we always are compelled to automate more of the process. And uh, the more we automate, the more slower they'll get usually, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, so today I'm hoping that I can share some insights and tips and tricks about uh, uh, making your build faster and your deployments and software delivery more enjoyable. My name is Zan. I'm a developer advocate at Circle CI. I'm based in London, UK, and uh, my greatest joy is uh, enabling and inspiring developers all around the world. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to get in touch with me, I'm quite active on Twitter, so twitter.com slash zmarkin, uh, or email me at zan at circleci.com. So yeah, without further ado, let's uh, let's begin. So yeah, what we'll cover today is uh, we'll cover some motivation why uh, we should really be interested in our build times and why should we be kind of on top of them. And uh, yeah, we'll look at how some ways and techniques we could use to track and measure our build times identify problems and bottlenecks and also decide how to react on those, how to improve our build times. And then, yeah, we'll actually look at how to react to some of those with practical examples. Um, and yeah, in a summary, we'll cover what we covered and uh, where to go next with some Q and A. So yeah, I hope you enjoy it. I've lived through this, so this problem of builds taking too long. I know this issue to heart, like very well. And I'm pretty sure some of you, if not most of you, have heard this one as well before. Um, my story about builds taking too long is uh, about five, six years old, uh, I was on an Android development team and uh, we managed to create an app and uh, that took eight-ish hours to build, essentially whole day. What this meant was I would get up, check my email, see, okay, CI has failed, great. Uh, poke around, make some changes, try to pass this build go to work, spend most of my day working. And before essentially coming back, uh, starting my journey back home, I would discover, oh, the build has failed again. So let's make those changes again and try to get it passing. And this would, this would repeat itself like all the time and uh, for several days in a row until we got on top of this. And our team was quite small. It was like four or five developers. So, uh, it wasn't very impactful, but uh, still, it was a very frustrating, frustrating time for for everyone because we couldn't really, we couldn't deliver, we couldn't ship, um, and yeah. So this is my motivation, personal motivation for giving this uh, presentation and uh, hopefully solving this problem for for some of uh, some others as well. So yeah. Before we go deep into builds and uh, how everything kind of comes together, let me take a step back and cover some of the basics that we will be repeating throughout, the, throughout this conversation. So CI-CD sits between developers committing code to their version control systems and productionizing uh, this, those applications. Essentially, we, Circle CI, uh, are the leading uh, CI CD platform. We take code from yeah your version control system, we build it, we test it, we run a bunch of scripts and we deploy that through to um, through your anywhere really, like any application from mobile apps to, to Kubernetes uh, applications, we can deploy that pretty much anywhere. And uh, yeah, that's how this works. 
and I'll show you briefly how um, how this product looks like, the platform looks like, and how we actually configure it so that when we are talking about this later, you'll you'll know what this all is about. So the platform circleci.com uh, app.circleci.com is uh, essentially this dashboard of your pipelines, your projects. Let's look at one. Um, for example, this is one of my demo applications. Uh, it's a Node.js application. And uh, I've configured as a bunch of workflows, jobs, builds. And each time I commit something to, to my uh, GitHub repository, which is uh, connected to it, this basically triggers another build. And what this does is, um, this is this corresponding repository. It takes the file called circleci config YML, so a YAML file in the .circleci directory, and analyzes it, reads it, and that's how we describe what we want our CI CD to really do. In our case, we're defining a bunch of uh, jobs. So build and test, vulnerability scan, deploy Docker, and a workflow called node test and deploy. We'll see this when we return to the dashboard. And we specify how we want our workflow to look like, in what order we want those jobs to execute, and uh, uh, so on. So yeah, anything, anything can go really in those jobs. Uh, they can run on various different environments from Docker containers to uh, Mac OS uh, virtual machines to Windows machines, all sorts of stuff, different sizes, different, uh, different platforms. Uh, yeah. So uh, going back to my pipeline, you can see that for each commit that I've made, uh, it's kind of triggered and it basically does what I told it to do. So in our case, I've configured my pipeline to say, yeah, do some testing, do some building, do some vulnerability scan, uh, and then wait for me to approve this to, to before deploying this to Docker Hub as a new Docker image. But yeah, whatever, whatever you're building, it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the idea. We've explained uh, workflows, contains everything that gets triggered from uh, VCS uh, commit jobs, which is an individual kind of test uh, verification building step. Um, and yeah, the whole thing is called a pipeline. Okay, let's go back now that we know how everything kind of comes together. Let's go back to build speed. Why do you really want to care about build speed? So the way I see it, teams that don't wait for their builds are more productive and they can ship more and they're more effective developers. They're happier developers because they're more productive. Um, faster builds also mean that we're able to react and, and uh, action change faster and Actioning change faster is very important in this uh, day and age. Um, and not only faster builds that pass, but also faster failing builds. We really want to get to some kind of signal telling us, okay, our code is not doing what it's supposed to do because some tests are failing, some something else is failing. And uh, we don't want to wait eight hours, for example, for this. We want minutes. We want, uh, yeah, up to an hour, whatever, whatever, whatever is important for your project, really. And yeah, inverse to this, slower builds means you're less capable to change, less capable to adapt, and your business is ultimately less competitive. So um, yeah, that's why we really need to care and worry about build speeds. Having said that, let's look at how we might want to measure and track our build durations and uh, in order to get on top of them. First off, how do you know that something is 
gone wrong, something is broken with your build. We're really, we really need to start with that because it's you can't really operate on a hunch. You really need to know uh, exactly what and uh, how it's going on. So I've identified a few ways that uh, you can look at this, but there's by no means uh, that they're not all of them, obviously. So you could see that your build times have been increasing. You could be measuring and tracking uh, for each build, you kind of track, okay, this one has taken uh, 10 minutes and the next week you're up to 20 minutes. So something must have happened that your build time has basically doubled. Um, builds could be more broken now than they were before. And that's another kind of indicator that something is, something is not there. And ultimately your, your team will tell you, like your team will tell you in retrospectives, your team will tell you, uh, that, yeah, they have a problem with CICD it, and CICD is the last thing you want to come up in, in retros that it's broken because it means that you're not able to ship. You're not able to, to do so automatically. And, uh, you're relying on a lot of error prone human local builds and, uh, manual processes to, to action your change that you're trying to, that you're trying to de deploy. And yeah, a couple of questions is a good thing to start about uh, your, your builds when, when you're kind of looking at ways to benchmark this. First off, what's happening, right? I've covered a bunch of them before. Are your builds slower? Are your builds uh, less, uh, less prone to, well, more error prone, more flaky? Um, so you might also be able to identify which parts of your builds are the most problematic. Maybe it's not the whole build that is failing more often. Maybe it's just a part of it that has suddenly become slower, more flaky, and uh, less stable. How stable are your builds? Are you able to say, yes, today we're at 90% uh, uh, success rate for our builds and Last week we were at 95. So where did this 5% go? Uh, and ultimately are they deterministic or flaky? Ideally you want to be as deterministic as possible. So you run a single build on a single commit and it's always gonna be either passing or failing and never like halfway, sometimes passing, sometimes failing. Um, but yeah, for, for speed, we're really mostly going to focus on what's happening to your builds and identifying which parts might be the most problematic because that's often what you'll find is that a certain job, a certain test that are taking longer than, uh, than the whole other part of your build essentially. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, recently released uh, circle ci insights which basically tells you just that um it tells you yeah how long your your builds are running so i went from one minute and 50 something to what five minutes uh reason for this is because i added the hold manual hold uh, task that basically uh waited for me to to finish it but it's still reflecting on on my build you can also see that on your job. So which, whichever job you're kind of running. So running my tests, running my deployments, um, it identifies how long that takes. And uh, in my case, yeah, vulnerability scanning is what takes the, the most uh, of your, of my build. And usually, you, usually you're gonna find something like that when you're looking at it. Um, obviously you, you can do this, with Circle CI, it's super convenient, but like any any build tool is able to kind of tell you it's ran for 50 seconds or it's ran for 45 seconds. And if you're if you're so keen, you can actually just drop these into a, a CSV or a, or a spreadsheet and uh, analyze them yourself, right? <clears throat> but yeah, if you're using Circle CI, you have those insights right there as as you're developing. Um, 
which is pretty cool. So now we know what's happening to our builds. We know which parts are slower, which parts are faster. So we know where to actually start focusing our uh, efforts. <clears throat> So now we can start looking at some techniques for optimization of our builds. First technique is uh, quite obvious, but very easy to forget that software is built on machines and uh, the more powerful your machine is, your, the faster it's gonna perform, right? So, uh, Fortunately, that's quite easy for uh, CI/CD to do, right? You just switch one line of code, and uh, you're using a machine of different size, of more uh, that's more performant, that has more RAM and uh, more CPU cores, and that should go faster. If you weren't using a service-based CI-CD and you had to rely on your local machine, you would obviously have to replace the processor, replace the RAM, all that stuff, and uh, that can take a bit more time. But anyway, common indicators of uh, performance uh, lags that are easily remedied by increasing the resources or if ramping up the resources that you're allocating to your builds are, yeah, just out of memory errors. So I used to work on an Android team. Uh, Android uh, uses uh, Gradle as a build tool. It's like got a lot of Java Kotlin compilation, which is quite memory intensive. And when apps grow, and they do, when you're adding dependencies, you're consuming more and more memory. And back then, like the default machines had like 508, 12 uh, megs of RAM. And uh, that just, not enough for most most of those jobs so you really need to kind of start increasing that to avoid out of memory errors sometimes you're running uh, builds and tests that uh, can utilize more cores of your processor and uh, that's when yeah a bigger more processing course is 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 a good idea what i found is that uh, in most kind of smaller applications that uh, essentially it's things you can build locally is trying to build it locally and seeing how long that takes on your local machine with what, 16 gigs of RAM, uh, eight uh, cores, 16 cores, whatever. And seeing if your CI CD is taking five times as long. So if that's the case, then it's very easy to just kind of increase uh the the resources and it's going to work obviously if you're building something that can't reasonably be built on a local machine uh, or, a, or a or a developer kind of consumer grade computer then obviously you you, you have a bigger problem but uh yeah that's kind of a bit easy benchmark that i found um in circle ci so this is just a snippet of uh, the config file that I showed you earlier. So um, the way to choose a resource class is by specifying a resource underscore class in your job that you're defining. And uh, you have a bunch of options available for Docker, for machine uh, executors, for all different kind of environments that you might be uh, writing your job for and uh, yeah for instance they're all they're all available in docs and I will be sharing the links to all of these things uh, later so you'll be able to find links to it easier but yeah by default you kind of run on two vCPUs with four gigs of RAM and yeah if you want something that's closer to a modern kind of desktop grade PC, you kind of go X large or XX large and uh, it's immediately a lot uh, uh, faster. But obviously not everything is as easy to improve as uh, just adding more machine to it because obviously bigger machines, bigger virtual machines cost more and uh, 
you're just going to see diminishing returns to to your to your performance especially if you're not utilizing all of the vcpus you're not utilizing all of the ram so you're going to start seeing some uh, issues come up and uh, so yeah if you can't really optimize using having a bigger computer then you have to go parallel and uh, be clever about it so yeah what you can do uh, another thing is you can orchestrate your jobs to run in parallel <clears throat> So we've seen uh, the workflow that I showed you actually had two jobs running in parallel. And uh, yeah, this will essentially speed up the entire workflow because instead of having one after the other, uh, you'll just run a bunch of them together and wait for just the slowest one to finish as opposed to slowest and the next slowest and the next next slowest all the way there. So in my example here, I'll be splitting uh, unit tests, uh, static code analysis, and dependency vulnerability check into these kind of parallel running jobs, which uh, operate independently before kind of uh, coming together with all the results when they're all passing and only then triggering uh, some kind of deploy job. So, yeah, when you're defining your workflows. This is, yeah, all of these code snippets, they're uh, config YAML uh, of Circle CI. So yeah, you're defining your unit test job and you pass in this requires argument and uh, tell it what uh, job it depends on. So for instance, we've had something that requires us first to build something and then uh, we can run these three um, unit test, static check, and vulnerability scan together um, before running deploy, which, yeah, specifies that all of these three are required. So that's like a very easy thing to do. And actually, if, if you're just listing all the jobs one after the other without using requires, they will all by default run in parallel. So uh, yeah, you can actually just get a lot of uh, performance just by doing something by default. But uh, sometimes people want to see it one after the other and that's, uh, that's something you can, you can fix by yeah, parallelizing. But not only workflows, when you have a list of jobs, you can also uh, parallelize uh, tests. That's something we could have benefited from in my earlier example. But uh, this was this was not available, and uh, we actually had to go kind of figure out manually how to split all of these tests. So, yeah, if you have a single kind of functional test job in our case, um, which kind of went through all the application screens and uh, ran a bunch of tests, like end-to-end -end tests, like a user would. Um, you can consider splitting those tests across uh, parallel jobs that is essentially just uh, work on a chunk of that uh, small proportion of that uh, whole test suite. And uh, yeah, if your test suite takes one hour or eight hours and you're kind of splitting them to six parallel jobs, you're, and you'll likely end up running something for 10, 15 minutes instead, which is... Uh, a substantial significant improvement in your build performance and your uh, sanity as well. So how to do this? Um, so CircleCI comes with uh, CircleCI CLI uh, tool that comes installed on your on all the all the Docker images, all the machines <clears throat> that you might want to use. And you use this circle CI test command, tests command to basically generate a list of tests, which you then pass to circle CI test split. And uh, that then lets you to split by file names, class names, timings. I like personally timings the most because it's able to actually identify um 
what combination of the tests in each uh, of the parallel jobs is going to be is going to run for approximately the same time so that you're not ending up with one job that's like twice as long as the others you're ending up with like this kind of normalized uh, job length even though yeah you'll you'll end up testing a couple of classes here a couple of classes there and just going to mix and match of everything but yeah so you're 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 likely to end up with uh, this kind of longer uh, command for testing, which basically passes uh, a list of list of tests to run to your uh, test command. In our case, that's a, a yarn example. So yarn is a testing uh, package and uh, build tool for uh, Node.js projects. Um, after we're done, if you're using timings. You need to uh, store test results, which basically send all that information to Circle CI, and uh, not only tells you in a nice way whether your tests are all green or which tests have failed, but also it kind of measures the times for each of the tests that it's run, and then that kind of helps uh, Circle CI make this educated. Uh, estimate of which tests to combine together so that uh, your kind of total run is as short as possible. Um, and last thing to do is essentially to set this parallelism uh, value to however many uh, machines you want to run uh, or containers you want to run uh, your parallel jobs in. And uh, the rest happens magically. Basically Circle CI figures out, okay, uh, first parallel job is going to run this first chunk, then second is going to run this second chunk, and it all kind of comes from this uh, command that you see here of splitting tests. And uh, it just figures out all of that automatically. Um, and yeah, I mentioned, yeah, this uh, store test results. Uh, let me actually show you this. Uh, I can show you in a workflow. Actually, I don't have my workflow here. Oh, it's going to be here. Tests. Yeah, it kind of shows you here uh, which whether your tests are passing or not. So if you go into your test job, you can actually analyze that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what we covered so far splitting or making job making sure that your jobs run in parallel where that's possible and to make sure that you can split your tests in the way that uh, you kind of cut a very, very kind of long running test uh, suite into several s smaller shorter running test suites next up when we have so many new test suites uh, smaller test suites to run we can utilize uh, some clever caching techniques to speed up their startup times, for example. Because uh, if you're using Node or, uh, or Java or any kind of heavy de dependency heavy projects, you'll, you're, you'll see that your kind of NPM installs, Yarn installs, uh, Gradle downloads of, of all dependencies can take really a long time. And uh, imagine that this happens on every single time you, you run your parallel, parallel test job. So you're basically adding like 10, 20, 50 a minute even uh, to each of those builds. And even though they run in parallel, you're still adding that time. Secondly, you can actually um, skip some compilation uh, compilation time by basically saying compile once and then store these results uh, and reuse this outputs uh, in other jobs that are kind of running subsequently. So we'll we'll show you this caching dependencies. Obviously, that's the first one, the most uh, easiest one to achieve. So yeah, if you're thinking each time you commit your uh, need to download, uh, do NPM install, all of that, you can actually use this uh, cache 
to make sure that if your dependencies don't change, you're kind of just reusing the same uh, same uh, local uh, local cache storage, which really makes uh, stuff faster. The way to do this is uh, add steps to your job that does the dependency installation or dependency uh, needs dependencies. So after we've checked out the code, we call restore cache, passing in a bunch of uh, keys that it's going to look for. First off, we're kind of optimizing for whatever the branch name is and whatever the checksum is for this package lock. Because obviously, if you're hashing this, that's uh, pretty easy to, to figure out whether it has changed or not. Then we're running npm install, which should be very quick if we already have the cache. And afterwards, we just save the cache. And we've introduced two commands called restore cache and save cache to this. Um, as a bonus, if you're using CircleCI orbs, which are a reusable configuration, uh, which are reusable configuration tools, and I think my video just went blurry. Give me a second. Yeah, I'll be just looking at this one. Sorry. Um, if you're using CircleCI orbs, for example, the Node.js orb actually, when you're running Node.js test job, it actually come with all these cache steps uh, written for you. So you really don't need to worry about this. It's just going to do this automatically, which is pretty cool. Um, next up, we have uh, caching uh, between jobs. So that's we were first one was like between uh, workflow runs. So between commits and now it's between jobs. So if you have jobs that run sequentially, you can actually uh, utilize a cache that passes some, uh, some stuff across those as well. So yeah, ex for example, if you have a heavy compilation step that produces a lot of kind of build artifacts, then um, your functional testing uh, job is essentially using that uh, those built artifacts and uh, running tests on that, then you can actually just build it once and skip that step altogether by just uh, by just uh, running the rest uh, very easily. So this workspace essentially mounts as a local uh, file system that you can kind of copy and paste stuff from your jobs, which is pretty cool. So what we have here is we have two jobs. One is called flow and the other one is called downstream. And our flow job is the first one to run, which calls persist to workspace. Uh, you pass in what, uh, where, this, where you want this to be. And uh, essentially this copies whatever you have uh, told it to copy somewhere. In our case, that's like workspace echo output uh, file, which is just like one hello world. And then our downstream job, which comes after our uh, flow job, it first attaches this workspace and you tell it where, so temporary workspace. And then you can actually just uh, see it here and use it as you, you had it here. So example, for example, if you have like compilation heavy step, you can just, uh, take those binaries and reuse them like you've already had them. So pretty clever. So yeah, you can see that we've kind of defined the first one and then the second one downstream requires this flow job to, to proceed. Uh, the last thing I wanna show you about caching is uh, caching Docker layers. So uh, this is useful when your actually your output is building uh, Docker layers, uh, Docker images, sorry. Docker layers are these kind of individual commands. So like work there, copy, run npm install, all of these, they are uh, layers in a Docker file. And CircleCI will let you cache each one of these layers uh, sequentially 
so that uh, whenever you're building the same image again, let's say if we're adding something on line 12, all the lines from one to 11 are going to be kind of immediately accessible from our cache so that we'll only need to execute uh, lines 12 to, to, to finish in our, uh, in our uh, Docker file to build our image. So if nothing has changed, your image will be built aut almost uh, instantaneously, which is pretty cool. To do this, um, yeah, you need to pass in either, uh, use either machine image or set up remote Docker environment. Uh, set up remote Docker essentially gives you a bunch of Docker related uh, tools to build uh, images and uh, interact with Docker. Um, and just pass in set up uh, Docker layer caching to true as an argument to this set up remote uh, Docker instruction, which basically does everything for you. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where it is. Um, there are obviously some limits to parallelism. You can like, I think if you're running like more than uh, 30 or 50, uh, yeah, it can, it can have like different, like 50 Docker kind of um, cache uh, uh, volumes created that cannot be reused uh, across, uh, across different jobs, each job. Uh, that runs at one time can only use a single volume. So uh, you can have 50 of those. So there is like, if you want higher par parallelism, then uh, you need to think about it a bit differently. And the last thing is, yeah, Docker layer caching does not apply to running jobs in Docker containers. So all of our node jobs that we showed earlier don't really uh, need that. Um, Next up is just choosing what you want to run when. For example, maybe your, your CI CD is set up so that you have an extensive functional test suite, you have coverage tests, you have a bunch of different uh, uh, moving parts set up that, but you don't really care about all of them at all times. So for example, if you're just reviewing a pull request or if you're just pushing a commit, to your, to your uh, source code repository, you really just need to care about unit tests and maybe a few integration tests and that's it. So you can actually choose what gets run when on a commit PR, on a tag, or even on a cron job and filter basically on, yeah, branches, tags, that kind of stuff and uh, decide which part of workflow and which workflow actually gets triggered. We have this uh, filters uh, argument to that goes into jobs in workflows and basically you specify, yeah, when you want this to run. For example, this one is uh, running functional tests, uh, full functional tests to it only when we're touching the main branch, which is, yeah, a pull request goes into main branch. You want to run all the tests. Otherwise, if you're just working on a feature branch, for example, you don't have to worry about this. Um, next one is uh, triggering. Yeah, maybe you want to do, maybe you want to set up a trigger for a nightly build that kind of produces, uh, uh, deploys to some kind of uh, nightly production environment. And uh, that's when you can actually use this schedule trigger which takes a cron and uh, works on whatever branch you specify. Again, main is usually the most common one. Um, yeah, so that's like, can really speed up your, your flow. And the last thing I wanna mention here is just kind of not all bottlenecks are really human, uh, technical in nature. Sometimes uh, there are human factors. We are all humans and uh, Often there is some kind of lack of trust involved that really leads to lengthy approval processes. A lot of people need to kind of uh, add their stamp to things before we can publish, we, before we can release. You've seen how my build earlier went from one minute to five minutes just because I added a 
hold step. Um, so yeah, CI/CD um, is a tool that's super useful and uh, it should be able to help you win that trust from your stakeholders, from your team members uh, by showing yeah, that change can really be actioned and managed uh, in an effective manner. Um, if you have a lengthy approval process, maybe set up some smart notification so that the person responsible uh, gets it, maybe ping them on Slack or something. And uh, yeah, so think about this. It's not always technical factors. Hey, Zian. The right time. Sorry, yeah. to, sorry to chime in here. We've got about eight minutes left. Okay. Uh, I will be... I think I've got like one more minute, so I'm pretty close to finishing. Um, yeah, so what's the right build time for your team? It, it honestly really depends on your team. I personally like this ambulance analogy to your CICD builds. They need to be as fast as possible, but again, not too fast because important things can really break if you're going kind to of skipping tests, if you're, if you're not really on top of uh, all, the, all the things you should be really testing, you should be uh, caring about. And yeah, when the, when the lights go flashing, you need to act on those failing builds immediately and make sure that uh, it gets unblocked. On this topic, we released this report called State of Software Delivery, um, I think back in uh, late uh, last year. We looked at a bunch of stats across, uh, from across uh, all the teams across the world and basically assembled some benchmarks for you to see what throughput teams are looking at, what um, kind of performance uh, they're seeing across the world. It's pretty cool. Uh, I would recommend you to uh, check it out. And next up, lastly, tomorrow we're running a meetup uh, on continuous delivery topic. It's an online one. Uh, we have Nick Jackson from HashiCorp talking about canary deployments and Angel Rivera from CircleCI uh, doing a practical introduction to our new feature runners. It's gonna be pretty cool. You should check it out. Uh, there is a URL in there, circle.ci slash continuous dash delivery dash evening. And that's all from me anyway. Thank you for your attention. I will take any questions you might have. It looks like we might already have one in the Q&A box here. I'm not sure if you're able to see that or I can read it for you. OK, yeah, I can see it. Um, does Docker layer caching work with OCI compliant image? Um, I don't know, but if you are able to email me so I know who you are, anonymous attendee, uh, then I will be able to find you that answer. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, fortunately. There's another question. In your experience, what kind of things does a development team go through forming, storming, norming, performing to move from problematic builds to fast builds in development uh, cycle? Um, I would say that in, in, our, in our kind of more, most drastic example, we were actually performing or at least we thought we were performing when our our builds became very slow just because we were so eager at adding tests and kind of making sure that every feature is is tested like end to end so that we really forgot about uh, the optimization aspect and uh, just woke up kind of in quotes woke up one day and discovered oh snap, our builds are way too slow. Um, I would say that 
it really depends on every team um, when they kind of go from problematic builds to fast builds. And uh, but if there is like human human factors again, like obviously storming is probably uh, when no one trusts anyone is also when you're likely to see people kind of act as gatekeepers to to um, to to deployments, that kind of stuff. Do you have CI/CD solution for telco vertical? What um, um, I mean, I don't know exact specifics or needs for telcos. Um, Circle CI really works with any programming language platforms out there. So I would imagine that you might find uh, it works well for, for that vertical as well. I'm not sure whether there is like uh, requirements beyond running something on your infrastructure or our cloud infrastructure or special kind of um, machinery required to to build and deploy so or maybe even um maybe even uh kind of verifications for uh, i know we have like several um accreditations from uh, various organizations uh, but I, I i i don't know about yeah specifics for telcos How to manage a large number of teams? Each of them are having uh, their own uh, Circle CI. Um, so, if you're using a single kind of uh, organization, let's say on GitHub, then every member of that organization could have access to to Circle CI in your in your plan. Um, obviously whatever whatever someone sees in in your vcs is also going to be something they can access in in uh, circle ci um what kind of what kind of issues are are you running into any particular issues regarding managing a large number of teams or um or something else We definitely have like very large teams uh, on organizations that we cover and uh, but yeah i'm not sure about the specifics of your question and we are right at time here um so we maybe have time for one more question if if one comes in but yeah if anyone uh wants to kind of ask about any other questions, please tweet me or email me um, at Zmarken on Twitter or Zan at CircleCI.com. Uh, I imagine I can also share my slides with you and you can then uh, post them. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. So I'll add some more resources and links so that folks can actually uh, find uh, what they might be looking for. Well, thank you so much, Zan, and thank you, Circle CI, and thank you to all the participants who joined us today. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, this recording will be available on the Linux Foundation YouTube page shortly. Um, thanks again, and have a great day.